Right. So for those of you who are watching, um, I would take a second here. We'll probably start in about, I don't know, a minute or two. Um, wait for everybody to get a chance to, to log on and, uh, and say hi. Um, in the meantime, I think I'll introduce the uh, series, well, the, uh, the seminar creator here is sitting in the coolest background setting for any seminar. So normally we wouldn't introduce everybody, but you guys have to see this. So Jen, say a few words. All right, so I'm Jen Biddle, and currently I'm up at the Pavilion Lake Research Project in British Columbia with the NASA Mobile Mission Command Center. And my colleagues and I are using ROVs and divers to check out microbialites at the bottom of this lake. And uh, Cameron is running the seminar for me because I wasn't sure if our comms would keep going. But NASA provides Wi-Fi in the most remote locations. So we'll have a group of people up here watching. Yeah, sweet. OK, so um, today's seminar is going to be given by Mike Wilkins, who's at the Ohio State University. He was at uh, Pacific Northwest National Labs before that, and before that um, I had met him. Uh, we crossed paths at UC Berkeley where he did uh, some postdoc work for uh, Joe Banfield, and so he's going to be talking about geomicrobiology at the rifle site, and uh, I think, Mike, if you're ready to go, we can just uh, let you take it away at this point. Oh, before we get started, um, we're going to be taking questions on Twitter. So if you have questions, go ahead and fire them off to either at microseminar or using, using the hashtag um, microseminar uh, with a little U and then a capital S seminar. Those will be good places to reach us for questions. And then at the end, what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll come back on and send those questions, ask those questions to Mike directly. So uh, Mike, without any further ado, go for it. Okay, thanks, Cam. Um, yeah, there's no way my office can really compete with that background that Jen has there. So as quickly as possible, I will uh, share my screen here. Um, let's see. Okay. Is this working, Cam? Yep. So far, just maximize it, and we're good. All right. Success. OK, well, first of all, uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending on, uh, on where you're, you're calling in from. Hey, Mike, uh, one second. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, can you uh, hit the presentation tools or something like that to make it full screen? Hmm. Yeah, should be already. Um, let me see what's up. OK. How's that? That's great. OK. All right, well, first of all, yeah, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I appreciate you all um, calling in today and foregoing the, uh, the Italy-Costa Rica World Cup match. Um, I know it will have been a, a tough decision, but uh, hopefully I can assure you that it probably made the right decision there. So. Uh, so today I'm going to present some data from research that I've been performing out at an aquifer test site in Colorado. Um, so I think later on in the summer, Kelly Wright is also going to be talking about some data from this site. So uh, hopefully the introduction, the sort of the brief introduction I, I present here will conserve uh, both talks. So uh, sort of before we dive into the actual data, uh, I just want to give you a, a bit of background as to sort of why we're doing this research and how we're doing it. So, first of all, why do, uh, why do I care about bacteria in the subsurface? Um, I'm probably preaching to the converted here, but obviously we know that bacteria catalyze uh, a wide range of reactions in the subsurface, and I'm interested in which reactions do they catalyze, how do they actually carry out these reactions in the subsurface? Now, this is interest, uh, interesting for a number of reasons. The subsurface uh, contains huge quantities of biomass, and because we have these large amounts of biomass, they actually drive a number of uh, key ecosystem functions. Uh, here in Ohio, for example, we, uh, we suffer from uh, high elevated iron-2 and, uh, and, and soluble arsenic in groundwater. Uh, and that's just one example. Bacteria can uh, mobilize metals. They can improve groundwater quality. And so really getting a, a better understanding of how bacteria uh, carry out these reactions 
uh, helps us understand how these ecosystem functions occur and helps us to predict uh, changing uh, system biogeochemistry over time. So to try and sort of better understand some of these questions, uh, we've been doing work out at this, uh, this field site in Colorado. So uh, the work I'm going to present today is, is based around sort of a core uh, field site. And I should probably state sort of right, right now that it, this isn't just me. We, are, uh, we work as part of a, a large interdisciplinary team. Uh, with geophysicists, geochemists, microbiologists, mineralogists, hydrologists. And so we try and sort of combine all this data to, uh, to get a better understanding of, of subsurface processes. Um, just to sort of to finally you know, reiterate some of these points, I've just pulled this, uh, this map of the, the lower 48 states, just showing the wide variety of, uh, of aquifer types uh, around the US. And every single one of these aquifers, there are going to be bacteria, in pore spaces, catalyzing reactions, like I say, improving groundwater quality, maybe mobilizing metals. And whilst we are doing some research in these areas, the truth is that we don't really understand very much about any of these processes in these systems. So, uh, so that's why uh, we're doing this research out in Colorado to try and improve our understanding of what's happening in environments like this. So. This is sort of a, a woe be me slide uh, coming up now because, of course, when we look at the subsurface, uh, this is sort of the, the view we get. Um, unfortunately, sort of by its nature, uh, we're dealing uh, with bacteria, you know, very small microorganisms that are existing in tiny pore spaces, uh, tens, hundreds, even thousands of meters uh, beneath us in the subsurface. Um, a couple of other sort of points to make here. Biomass densities in many of these environments are pretty low, between 10 to the 3, 10 to 5, maybe 10 to the 6 cells per mil. Um, understanding what they're doing is frequently difficult because reaction rates uh, may be relatively slow in these environments due to temperature um, or simply low concentrations uh, of starting compounds. And then even if uh, the bacteria are um, growing, metabolizing compounds, it's frequently difficult to actually measure some of these compounds. Um, they can either be utilized by other microorganisms, for example, for fermentation products like acetate or hydrogen. Uh, others may uh, react abiotically. So uh, biogenic sulfide is a good example. Will react with iron 2, uh, precipitate from solution, and then suddenly you don't see uh, sulfide in your, uh, in your groundwater assays. So, so just a couple of reasons as to why uh, it's tricky to uh, assess what's happening in the subsurface. So this is our field site here in Colorado where we're attempting to sort of overcome some of these problems here. Um, it's located in the, uh, the upper basin of the Colorado River drainage. It's about 200 miles west of Denver on the banks of the Colorado River. You can see the river uh, in the top right hand corner of the image. And this is a, it's a shallow unconfined aquifer at the site. It used to be the location of a former a uranium and vanadium milling operation earlier in the 20th century. There's a lot of uranium ores that are mined in this part of Colorado, so they would be milled here at the site, and as a result, there was a large amount of residual uh, contamination from those activities. Uh, that's since been uh, cleaned up, sort of topsoil was removed from the site, and uh, the site's been capped and, and planted, and so that's why the land looks so flat, and we have sort of lines of, lines of grasses growing here. Um, some other characteristics of the site, obviously with the Colorado River uh, so close, just in the top there, uh, that we have high connectivity between the groundwater and the Colorado River water at the site. Uh, quite surprisingly, we actually have pretty low dissolved oxygen concentrations, um, frequently at, at sort of the level of, of detection. So uh, it's a fairly anoxic system. As a remnant of the former mining and milling operations on the site, there are some dissolved uh, uranium-6 and vanadium compounds in groundwater, but in terms of electron acceptors for uh, sort of anaerobic microbial respiration, uh, the largest pools are iron-3 and sulfate. So at the field site, we, we use a technique called biostimulation, and our aim at the site is to use uh, biostimulation, the addition of a carbon compound to the subsurface, to try and jumpstart microbial activity. Can we stimulate bacteria to carry out a process of interest, a desired process, and then will this biostimulation uh, 
process allow us uh, to study reaction products and to study the metabolisms of the of the organisms that are carrying out these these desired processes so at the field site we use acetate as our, our carbon compound of choice uh, a couple of reasons for that it's relatively cheap uh, when you're adding a carbon source to uh, to an aquifer you don't want to be putting something that's too expensive into the groundwater um, the other thing it's it's non-fermentable and so we can predict fairly well sort of what kind of metabolisms we are we are going to stimulate and it can be used by a wide range of microorganisms that exist in the rifle subsurface um, here are just a couple of pictures here uh, this is my colleague Ken Williams who many of you know from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and this is uh, true bucket chemistry out in the field here we are just mixing acetate with groundwater and then on the right hand side we have one of these uh, large storage containers this contains groundwater that we've pumped from up gradient portion of the aquifer we mix it with acetate and then it gets uh, re-injected into the aquifer of course uh, getting carbon into the aquifer re requires us to call out uh, Bort Longyear they come out to the field site with their drill crews and they install what we call uh, a flow cell in a portion of the aquifer um, this is what the flow cell actually looks like from sort of a bird's eye view you will see the straight uh, line of wells down the middle of this slide uh, starting off at CG01 and ending CG10 these wells are our injection wells so this is where acetate amended groundwater is re-injected back into the aquifer you can see in the top left we have uh, predominant uh, groundwater flow direction that carbon is then carried down gradient uh, by flow to this wide series of down gradient monitoring wells um, and in the top of the flow cell you'll see a well uh, about two and a half meters down gradient called CD01 and this is the well that we've focused sort of a lot of the microbial uh, analyses on and so sort of then the final uh, image here is this is what it actually looks like in reality in the foreground here you can see those uh, those injection wells uh, just popping out of the ground and so that is where uh, the carbon is going into the subsurface and then sort of further in the back of this picture we have these uh, these down gradient monitoring wells so that's the process by which we carry out this biostimulation so what actually happens when we put a uh, acetate into the ground well as you'd expect when you suddenly add uh, carbon to a system a relatively oligotrophic system you stimulate microbial activity so here just in this sort of this schematic we have uh, acetate being oxidized to CO2 and microorganisms can couple this oxidation to a wide series of, uh, of redox reactions uh, just an example here is the reduction of iron 3 to iron 2 and uranium 6 gets reduced to uranium 4 which precipitates uh, from solution as well so before I show you some sort of geochemical profiles of what we observe uh, following this, this biostimulation process, I just want to briefly just go through, I'm not sure quite who's listening in, so I just want to go through some of the chemical reactions that we observe just so that the, uh, the geochemical plots make sense. So the possible redox reactions uh, in the aquifer sediments following uh, carbon addition, following this acetate amendment. Uh, the first one, like I said, iron 3 and sulfate are the two dominant terminal electron accepting processes so iron 3 gets reduced to iron 2 this is soluble so we see increasing iron 2 in our, in our assays again sulfate gets reduced to sulfide sulfide again is insoluble so we see increasing sulfide concentrations in our geochemical plots conversely uranium 6 is soluble but uranium 4 is insoluble so as this process is occurring we see decreasing uranium concentrations in groundwater uh, there are some other uh, potential electron acceptors in the subsurface as well like I say vanadium and uh, selenium are both present uh, in groundwater uh, as with uranium as vanadium is being reduced we see decreasing vanadium concentrations in groundwater because vanadium 4 is insoluble and again the same story with selenium selenium 6 gets reduced to elemental selenium which is insoluble so when we see selenium reduction selenate reduction we see those concentrations decreasing in groundwater okay so hopefully that wasn't too much information all at the same time but this is an example plot of what we see in a well uh, a down gradient monitoring well like CDO1 so what we have here in the uh, the lightly blue shaded portion of the graph this is the portion of time where we're adding acetate to groundwater 
the graph is showing uranium-6 concentrations and total iron. But because we're looking at soluble iron, this is pretty much iron-2. So as we're adding acetate, what do we see? We see decreasing uranium concentrations. Uranium-6 is reduced to uranium-4, precipitates from solution. And then concurrent to that, we see increasing concentrations of iron-2, suggesting that the organisms that are reducing iron potentially reducing uranium as well. So that's what happens when we add acetates to the subsurface for approximately 25 to 30 days. We get this period of dominant iron reduction and also the concurrent removal of uranium from solution. If we extend the period of carbon amendment, we see something like this. Again, this 25-day, 30-day period of dominant iron reduction, which are the, uh, the black uh, circles, and then the open circles, these are sulfide. So if we then increase, if we then increase the period of time of carbon amendment, we see we go from dominant iron reduction to dominant sulfate reduction, and we see these large increases in aqueous sulfide appearing in these down gradient monitoring wells. So that's what's happening in terms of the sort of the major system biogeochemistry uh, during carbon amendment. So one thing we're interested in who's catalyzing some of these reactions. So a few more plots for you here. If uh, first of all we just uh, uh, look on the left hand side, again we have uh, a down gradient monitoring well and a couple of uh, geochemical species. At the bottom you can see acetate and we see this sort of this millimolar increase in acetate concentrations over time. And this is coupled uh, to uranium-6 removal from solution, increases in iron-2. Uh, one thing we have here, we're, we're plotting GLT-A. So this is the citrate synthase gene uh, in Geobacter. So uh, sort of a fairly well-characterized iron-reducing uh, bacteria. And it turns out that it has a very unique uh, citrate synthase gene. It's more sort of like a eukaryotic uh, citrate synthase. And so we can use this as a biomarker uh, for Geobacter species. And as you can see, if we look at gene copies of GLT-A, you can see that it tracks very nicely with uh, acetate amendments of the system. So this is one piece of evidence that we are stimulating uh, geobacter species as we put carbon into the system. Uh, there's a couple of other uh, sort of plots on here as well. These, this sort of data is, is relatively old now, but we, uh, we coupled some of this, uh, this functional gene analysis to some sort of fairly uh, simple t riflip analysis with both 12 carbon and 13 carbon that went into the aquifer. And you can see that we were able to pull out uh, t riflip sequences that were related to geobacter species. And if you look in that, uh, that boxing area, plot C, you can see that uh, t riflip peaks uh, clustered with geobacter. Uh, more specifically, some of these strains, geobacter bimigiensis and strain M21. So we have a, a good indication at this point that uh, acetate is stimulating uh, geobacter species. These are well known to be able to reduce, re to reduce iron, uh, to reduce uranium. So what we wanted to do was look at this in a, in a bit more detail. So in 2010, we went out to the site and we collected uh, sort of a time series, uh, time course uh, biomass samples from the aquifer during uh, carbon amendment. Uh, we extracted DNA and then uh, performed something called 16S Emerge. Uh, Emerge is a program developed by Chris Miller uh, when he was at UC Berkeley. He's now at, um, at CU Denver. And this allows us to uh, get deep sequencing, uh, 16S sequencing, uh, using Illumina HiSeq. And then we can take those short Illumina reads and reconstruct full length uh, Geobacter, uh, full length 16S sequences. So this was a technique that we did over a time course of samples. And here we have plotted up uh, the 16S uh, relative abundance of geobacter and also OTU richness over time. A couple of things to, to sort of to point out in this graph here. Um, at about uh, early on, you'll see that there isn't uh, a huge enrichment of geobacter. But then at approximately nine days, we look at the relative abundance of geobacter uh, 16S uh, reads. Approximately 80% of the microbial community uh, is geobacter, which is a huge enrichment of geobacter species. And if we look at the OTU richness, you'll see that uh, the richness isn't particularly high. So it's a couple of geobacter strains that are rapidly responding to acetate. As we carry on over sort of this 30-day period, you will see uh, relative abundance uh, drops off somewhat. 
the OTU richness increases over time. So what we can take from this data is that a few strains respond very rapidly to carbon amendments. Uh, and then sort of as you go on, as the, the, the duration of carbon amendment increases, other Geobacter strains sort of gradually uh, increase as well until you have uh, large numbers of, of Geobacter OTUs. But I want you to keep in mind that Geobacter initially comprises approximately 80% of the microbial community. This is a huge enrichment because Geobacter aren't the only species that are able to, to utilize acetate in the subsurface, but something means that they're able to completely outcompete a lot of other acetate acetate oxidizers uh, in the microbial community. So I just wanted to plot up some of the, um, some of the reads that we recovered using this, uh, this 16S emerge technique. Uh, in bold, we have uh, geobac uh, geobacters that have been isolated that are in pure culture. And so I've, 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 I've treed out their 16S sequences. All the other, uh, all the other um, nodes on here are sequences we, we, we recovered. And so a couple of things to note, first of all, we have at the top of uh, the tree here, we have this large group of, of sequences that are uh, somewhat related to Geobacter bumigiensis, M21, M18, this sort of general clade. And then we have some other sequences in, in the sort of the lower part of the tree. If we actually plot the relative abundance data on here, we get to start to see which of the strains that actually increased uh, the most over time. So here we have abundances after four days, nine days, 16 days, 25 days, and 30 days. And you can see uh, these strains that are closely related to Geobacter bumigiensis. These are the ones that are responsible for increasing uh, relative abundance over time. Uh, they're still the most abundant, even at these later time points, at 25 days, at 30 days. But you'll see, if you look in the lower part of the, ta of the, uh, of the tree, you'll see some of these other strains are starting to increase in abundance then as well. So this gives us an indication of sort of the strain level uh, dynamics uh, of the Geobacter population during uh, acetate addition to the subsurface. So this begs the question then. So we know that Geobacter species are responding to, to the carbon, um, potentially maybe likely responsible for uranium-6 reduction. But what is it about the species that allows them uh, to dominate the community? How can they use acetate so efficiently? So, what we decided to do was to use uh, some proteomic techniques to actually take a closer look at the Geobacter population in the rifle subsurface. So again, I'm probably uh, sort of it's going back to basics here. Obviously, if we look at the, the metagenomes uh, from the rifle site, we see functional potential. If we look at uh, RNA transcripts, this gives us an indication um, that genes are, are being expressed. But then if we look at proteins, this really is the smoking gun. If a protein is being expressed, that's a, that's a large uh, energetic cost to a cell. So there's a very good chance it's playing a role of some sort in the subsurface. So we decided to focus on, on proteins initially uh, using a technique called shotgun proteomics. This is basically the analysis of all the proteins uh, in the system. Uh, this was our, our slightly over-engineered and complex system. We were using a tangential flow filtration to recover biomass in the planktonic phase, so pumping groundwater, using a tangential flow filter to concentrate that biomass. You can see uh, on the left-hand panel there, as the groundwater came up from the subsurface, it went through a series uh, of, uh, of rock salt and ice chilling baths to immediately lower the temperature of the groundwater and prevent any changes in the proteome. Um, and then if you look in panel D, this is sort of what you end up with after many hours of, of blood, sweat, and tears. We have uh, a couple of milliliters of highly concentrated uh, biomass that we can then use uh, for shotgun proteomics. So in case people aren't uh, too familiar as to what this technique actually involves, uh, like I say, it's the extraction and the analysis of all the proteins from an environmental sample. So uh, we use uh, two-dimensional uh, liquid chromatography coupled to tandem mass spectrometry. So we take our concentrated biomass, we extract proteins, Using an enzyme like trypsin, we digest these proteins into peptides, and these peptides are then run on the tandem mass spectrometer. And this gives us mass spectra. Unfortunately, at this point, that's all that we get. We just have mass spectra. And so there's actually a second portion uh, to this whole uh, sort of analysis pipeline uh, for shotgun proteomics, and that involves having a complementary DNA sequence, whether that be metagenomics or whether it be isolate genomes. 
you take your DNA sequence. From that, you can obviously predict your protein sequence. Because trypsin only cleaves proteins at certain sites, you can also predict what peptides you will get from your predicted protein sequence. From your predicted peptides, you can calculate uh, predicted mass, and you match these predicted masses with your measured mass spectra. And in a perfect world, these all match up perfectly, and you can identify peptides and therefore proteins. So that's the way this technology works. Um, because we had observed such a high concentration of Geobacter, because sort of the dominant community members appeared to be closely related uh, to some of these cultured Geobacter strains, uh, for this analysis here, we actually uh, used Geobacter bimigiensis as our, uh, the Geobacter bimigiensis genome as our search database. So we took this biomass, and using Geobacter bimigiensis, we were able to recover approximately sort of 1,250 proteins um, over, this, over these series of samples, which is pretty impressive. Uh, the genome itself contains about uh, 4,106 genes, and so we got about 30% of all the possible proteins detected 30%. And so this data then allowed us uh, to reconstruct metabolisms and develop hypotheses as to why these things are so efficient in the subsurface. So in terms of the analysis, uh, Geobacter species um, have been of interest for sort of well over a decade now. Uh, they've been isolated for a while and been studied uh, in the laboratory. Uh, people have sequenced genomes, inferred metabolisms in the lab, and then also got to this point where we're able to uh, develop constraint-based models of how the microorganism's metabolism works. Uh, and so there's a, there's a number of these papers out there looking at the central metabolism uh, of Geobacter species. And what they often see is uh, sort of a high degree of redundancy in many uh, pathways uh, in, in central metabolism. And this is just a figure taken from one of these papers, just showing a conversion between pyruvate and acetyl-CoA. Geobacter contains four possible pathways uh, for this conversion. And the same with uh, the conversion of succinyl-CoA to succinate. Again, there are two potential pathways. Uh, and in the laboratory, uh, tests have shown sort of which, uh, which pathway is, uh, is utilized. But the question really remains, do these laboratory tests reflect what's happening in the environment? Uh, just because it's the dominant pathway in a, in a laboratory culture, does that mean that's what the cells are using uh, in the subsurface itself? So we wanted to use this data to actually look at some of these pathways in more detail and work out uh, where this sort of redundancy uh, occurred. Uh, again, I've just here in this figure here, I've taken part of the data, uh, and just and obviously this is a very small subset of uh, of those of those proteins that we detected, and just broken it up into a couple of different categories. Up here we have. Uh, proteins responsible for the conversion, the activation of acetate to acetyl-CoA. We have proteins associated uh, the TCA cycle. Uh, those associated with the conversion uh, of acetyl-CoA and pyruvate. And then down here, involved with uh, glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So uh, just looking at the data in terms of spectral counts, we get indication of, of which proteins are the most abundant um, over these uh, periods of time, so early, middle, and late periods of carbon amendment. And so taking this data, we're able to uh, develop a sort of a, a cartoon cell uh, showing how we uh, think metabolism is occurring in the subsurface in these microorganisms. And so I just want to highlight a couple of, um, a couple of sort of inferences that we made from this data, potentially explaining why Geobacter are so good at responding to acetate and dominating the microbial community to the, the extent that they do. So first of all, Nitrogen fixation. Even though we can detect some ammonia, uh, some ammonium in groundwater, uh, we always see expression uh, of nitrogenase uh, proteins. We, see, we, we detect nitrogenase proteins, suggesting that whilst we do see ammonium, sort of in bulk groundwater measurements, uh, in sort of the highly heterogeneous sort of subsurface environment, there may well be uh, microsites, microenvironments where large amounts of growth are occurring, where potentially uh, ammonium is depleted. Uh, the ability of Geobacter to fix nitrogen gives it a competitive advantage over other cells that can't carry out this process. So one potential uh, explanation there as to why uh, they can outcompete other species. I also want to focus on uh, this here. This, the activation of acetate to acetyl-CoA is obviously a key process for Geobacter. Uh, they're seeing 
one, two, potentially three millimolar um, concentrations of acetate in the subsurface. So it's key that they can convert acetate to acetyl-CoA for biomass synthesis and for respiration. So there are three different pathways that Geobacter uh, can use to activate acetate. One is via an acetyl-CoA synthase. Um, one is via an acetyl-CoA transferase. And they also have a, a two-enzyme system, acetate kinase and phosphotransacetylase. They're in green. So three different pathways for converting acetate to acetyl-CoA. So what do we actually see in terms of the data? Sorry, this is a... Uh... Okay, for some reason we're missing out a slide here. Well, um, anyway, what do we see? Uh, we see acetyl-CoA transferase. Uh, this is the enzyme that is uh, most abundant in our proteomic data sets. And it's an interesting enzyme because it carries out a dual function. It's actually uh, coupled to part of the TCA cycle as well. So while it's converting um, acetate to acetyl-CoA, it's also converting succinate to succinyl-CoA. What this means in terms of metabolism is that every, uh, every mole of acetyl-CoA that is um, generated by this enzyme is then fed into the TCA cycle because it's a, this, this enzyme has dual function. What this means further is that any acetyl-CoA uh, for biosynthesis must come from a different pathway. And so uh, this is where this other pathway comes in, this acetyl, uh, this acetate kinase phosphotransacetylase pathway, this two-step process. Uh, so we do see uh, evidence of that this, uh, this pathway is active as well. And so in this instance, it looks like the redundancy um, for converting acetate to acetyl-CoA is actually related to uh, some carbon going into uh, respiration uh, through acetyl-CoA transferase, and then uh, this region here, this is then converting um, acetate to acetyl-CoA for biomass synthesis. Now I want to look here. So as we've uh, produced acetyl-CoA, uh, the problem with acetyl-CoA is uh, it's a two-carbon uh, compound, and so this obviously isn't much use to the cell. The cell needs uh, four carbon compounds for biomass synthesis. And so how do they go about generating uh, these compounds? Well, many microorganisms uh, get around this problem uh, by the glyoxylate bypass. Uh, this uh, process takes uh, two moles of acetate to form uh, one mole of malate is then converted into pyruvate. Fortunately, Geobacter does not have the glyoxylate bypass. Instead, what we see in the proteomic data is the activity of an enzyme called pyruvate ferredoxin oxidoreductase, this POR enzyme. And what this does is, this, is a, this operates in two directions. It can take pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, but it can also take acetyl-CoA to pyruvate. So it's a pretty cool enzyme. Uh, what it does is it takes uh, reducing power from the TCA cycle, and it's actually a carbon fixation step as well. It takes CO2, and it takes the CO2, takes the acetyl-CoA, and generates pyruvate. So compared to the glyoxylate bypass that requires uh, two moles of acetyl-CoA to form one mole of malate, the activity of this pore enzyme is actually a very efficient process. You only need one mole of acetyl-CoA per mole of pyruvate but you obviously need CO2 as well. So this is one of the reasons uh, why you grow geobacter in the lab in bicarbonate buffer. Have that bicarbonate for the carbon fixation step. Uh, interestingly, in terms of uh, abundance of proteins, we see the greatest abundances of this pyruvate ferredoxin oxidoreductase, the earlier time points in biostimulation, when it looks like geobacter is increasing in biomass, uh, lots and lots of cell growth, and so it's potentially uh, one example there of uh, of this enzyme uh, increasing activity at this time point. So uh, from some of these observations then, uh, we can sort of summarize that uh, this carbon amendment to the subsurface allowed us to study uh, anaerobic metabolism for this, this key geobacter species involved in iron and uranium metabolism. Uh, what it's done is allowed us to actually uh, validate some modeling and laboratory studies uh, that have been carried out in the past. And the nice thing uh, we've, sort of, we've taken from this study is that 
Um, it seems that Geobacter is one of these species that grows in the lab very similarly to how it grows in the environment, uh, certainly in the experiments that we carried out at Rifle. So uh, that was a nice observation to make. Uh, we've identified a couple of mechanisms for the efficient uh, utilization of acetate via um, redundant systems and then also uh, converting acetyl CoA to pyruvic biosynthesis, biomass synthesis. Uh, and sort of in the last slide here, I just want to sort of uh, go over a few things that we're currently doing at the rifle site. So um, obviously this work is all in a rather uh, unusual system in that we're giving the microorganisms millimolar concentrations of carbon, which they're not likely to encounter uh, under sort of background uh, conditions at the rifle site. So having got the, the sort of the sampling technology down and some of the techniques down, we're now applying the same technology to these non-biostimulated portions of the rifle aquifer. And this is some sort of fairly recent data that I will uh, show you now. So I've collected a couple of samples uh, last year in April and May uh, 2013. And uh, again, protein recovery has been, has been pretty good. We've coupled this analysis to, metage to metagenomes provided by um, Jill Banfield and her students at UC Berkeley. And you can see that we detect between 1,500 and uh, 2,500 proteins per sample. So we're getting a good look at sort of uh, functional activity. Metabolisms that we can potentially infer from, uh, from some of these uh, protein analyses include uh, nitrate-dependent ion oxidation, uh, aerobic ion oxidation, uh, fermentation, nitrate reduction, and also uh, microaerophilic uh, heterotrophy. And so I just want to show you one example here. Uh, unfortunately, if any of you have seen uh, Jill talk recently, either at Goldschmidt or anywhere else, um, you'll know that there's unfortunately a lot of novelty in terms of uh, microbial function and metabolism in the rifle subsurface. So a, a distressingly large number of proteins we detect uh, come from organisms that are unknown with functions unknown. But one thing we do see is um, evidence for um, chemoautotrophy. And so here we have an example of members of the Gallian ACA. Um, we detect uh, proteins from four different species and we have evidence for uh, carbon fixation through rubisco. Um, some of this uh, microaerophilic respiration via a, a CBB3 type um, cytochrome C oxidase and then also uh, uh, nitrate reductase as well. So we're starting to be able to reconstruct metabolisms from background regions uh, of the field site and actually get a handle um, on what might be going on under these non-biostimulated conditions. So um, it's just looking at my timer, I see I'm a few minutes over at sort of 33, 34 minutes. So um, obviously this work has a, a lot of people involved in it and uh, just a couple of names I want to thank. Uh, Bob and Kelly here at OSU, um, Jill at UC Berkeley, Ken Williams and Phil Long, both from LBL, who sort of operate the field site, and then uh, proteomics collaborators at Oak Ridge, it's Bob Hettick, and Mary Lipton at uh, Pacific, Northwest, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and obviously many other people who are all part of the Rifle IFRC science team. And so with that, uh, like I say, thank you for listening in, and uh, if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to take them. Cool. Thanks, Mike. That's uh, that's a really nice look at what's going on there. Um, we did have a few questions that have come in over Twitter, which is killer. Thanks for all your questions, guys. Um, I think the first one came in pretty early on. It was from uh, Mike Hansen. He's asking, uh, do you get any uh, biofouling issues right at the beginning about when you're adding acetate to these wells, do you have issues with biofouling? Um, yes, yeah, sometimes we do. Um, we, well, it's actually been fairly tricky to, to try and sort of tease apart exactly what's going on because you have a couple of processes occurring. We have um, obviously biomass accumulation in pore spaces, um, especially once we get into sulfate reduction. We have a lot of mineral precipitation as well as sulfide reacts with iron and precipitates out. Um, but it turns out one of the major um, problems in terms of uh, pore clogging is actually uh, gas production. Uh, Peter Jaffe has done, uh, Princeton has done some really nice work uh, showing that it's actually gas bubbles accumulating in pore spaces uh, that are causing uh, a lot of the clogging issues that we sometimes see around. Uh, a lot of the, this sort of happens mostly around the injection wells because this is where the highest concentrations of acetate are obviously seen. Uh, and it turns out that it's actually gas bubbles uh, in these regions that seem to cause the, sort of the, the most problems uh, for clogging. So we do, we see biofouling, mineral precipitation and uh, 
and sort of gas bubbles as well. So it is a problem, um, but uh, it's uh, it, it doesn't doesn't crop up too often though. So interesting, cool. Okay, I'm going to keep the questions coming because they're flowing in. Mike, uh, if you turn off your screen sharing, we might be able to see your uh, your lovely mug while you answer questions here. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, from Paul Carini, there was a question: uh, Does pH affect the solubility of iron and uranium species, and does the acetate addition affect the pH? So, are you seeing changes in the pH due to that addition, and how does that interplay with with uh, what's going on with those metal reductions? Yeah, we don't see um, too much pH change during the period of dominant iron reduction. Um, once we get into these long periods of sulfate reduction, if we if we sort of we drag the experiment out beyond 30 days, we start to get into sulf uh, sulfate reduction, and at that point you start to see a lot of alkalinity being re being produced by uh, the activity of SRB, and so uh, you do sort of see trending uh, pH increases um, over time. Um, they're not dramatic though; you know, we're generally still sort of around circum neutral. Um, it doesn't look like that has too much of an effect on. Um, on the speciation of uranium or uranium complexes and things like that, uh, but obviously it does a sort of more extreme, uh, more extreme shifts. But generally, we're looking at uh, changes between sort of 6.9 up to maybe 7.5, something like that. So, okay. interesting, cool. Okay, um, there's some more questions here on uh, more getting into sort of speciation of organisms and metabolism. Uh, Mike Hansen says. Uh, uh, did Geobacter's metabolic diversity allow it to be an efficient uranium reducer because it has the ability to maintain reducing power? Um, in other words, I think he's kind of getting at here: is it is it is it a uh, does it have the ability to to kind of keep going with these reduction reactions in a in a more effective way than other organisms potentially? Yeah. So I, probably there's a couple of things I should note here. Um, so. All the samples that I'm talking about here, these are all uh, planktonic biomass. This is biomass that we've pumped from the aquifer. So uh, that's one thing uh, to note. So we're not talking about cells that are attached to, uh, to mineral particles in the subsurface. These are all cells that are free swimming in, in poor spaces. Um, and there's been some work done suggesting that uh, Geobacter can sort of build up reducing potential in cytochromes even if they're not attached to iron minerals and things like that. So uh, sort of one hypothesis is that that's what makes them efficient at reducing uranium, because even when they're in the planktonic phase, they can obviously interact with uranium, with soluble uranium-6, and then use that reducing potential uh, to actually transform uranium-6 to uranium-4. So uh, yeah, that's something that's uh, probably still um, hasn't been completely solved at the rifle site, um, but that's certainly one good one good hypothesis as to what's going on. Nice. Okay, from uh, from Derek Learman, we have a question saying, uh, as the Geobacter OTU richness increases, do you think the newer strains are playing different roles in metabolism? In other words, are we is that all uh, is that all functional redundancy, or are we starting to see actual me metabolic variation that's that's based on that strain level differences? Yeah, it's something that's that's hard to get a handle on. I mean, sort of my personal thought is that, and I'm not exactly sure where this is coming from, but my personal thought is that the, obviously the in microenvironments the geochemical conditions are, are changing over time. We're having uh, sort of low-level sulfide being produced and uh, various other geochemical changes in the environment. And so I like to think that this increase in OTU diversity is associated with uh, these sort of fine-level uh, geochemical changes. And so you have these different niches that are being that are occurring. And then these geobacter, the other sort of lower abundance geobacter OTUs are responding to these geochemical changes and occupying uh, some of these slightly different niches. Uh, and then for whatever reason, uh, they don't quite um, sort of increase in abundance to the same degree as some of the uh, the other more dominant OTUs, but they are playing roles uh, in the subsurface, whether it be um, uh, sort of utilization of, uh, of dead biomass or tolerance of increasing sulfide concentrations, anything like this could potentially explain why we start to see this uh, increase in, in OTU numbers. Yeah, cool. All right, and uh, let's see, the, the, the latest question comes from, from Carrie Weber. She asks, uh, do you see any evidence for autotrophic iron reduction via Geobacter specifically or, or by any organisms uh, out there in the field? Um, 
under the biostimulated under the biostimulation conditions, uh, we don't unfortunately. We're just giving it so much carbon. Uh, heterotrophy is is pretty dominant at that point. Um, I think sort of this these new data sets that are, are sort of are coming online. There's a lot more evidence for autotrophy uh, in these systems. Uh, that sort of that last slide I hinted at. We have evidence, obviously, for uh, members of the the Galeanaceae. Um, they seem to be uh, fixing CO2, but again, obviously coupled to, to iron oxidation rather than iron reduction. So uh, this data is still being curated. I mean, uh, at UC Berkeley, they have huge amounts of metagenomic data now that sort of they're working through, and so. Uh, potentially in those data sets there may well be um, autotrophic iron reduction. Uh, I think probably time will tell at this point. Uh, but then we have the, we have the proteomic data, so once the uh, once the metagenomes are curated, we can actually probe uh, our proteomic data sets with those metagenomes and see if we have any evidence for that. So. Cool. Great. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions for Mike? I've got the Twitter feed open. We've got, uh, got some... Uh, I know people are wanting to watch a World Cup game, but if you've got any last-minute questions, you can fire them in now. Or you can always just tweet to microseminar um, at any point, and we can pass these questions on to the author or to the speakers and make sure that they, they answer your questions. So um, let's see. Jen, do you have anything else you want to say? No, I was just going to say the score is 0-0. Zero, zero. <laughs> <laughs> and just remind everyone that you can contact Mike at uh, his hashtag is MJ underscore Wilkins, uh, and you can ask him questions directly if you need to. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, uh, I guess we'll sign off here. Thank you very much, Mike, and uh, we'll see you guys in two weeks for another micro seminar. Cheers. All right. Thanks, thanks for organizing, guys. Mike. All right. Thanks.